What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. We've got a really great episode planned for y'all tonight. Uh, we're bringing on someone from up in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm uh, going to talk about striper fishing and speckled trout fishing up there. Uh, as I always say too, it's like just because this person is not from your area, um, honestly, I think it's a better way to learn is learning from people that are fishing different fisheries and different estuaries and tactics and tricks that they're applying in their area sometimes will ring a bell and you're like man that would work in what i do so i'm real excited to talk with our guest here before we get into that i'm just going to remind you all about our private facebook group um really the only reason it's private is to to keep i don't even know why it's private but go join it you can you can talk with other listeners and uh, other anglers and hopefully you know, you know learn some stuff there and create some fishing buddies you can get out in the water with and the other thing too is if you love this podcast and want to help support us on the back end uh, you can go check out our Patreon account. All that stuff will be linked in the show notes um, on all the podcast platforms as well as YouTube. And without me ruining this by talking too much, I'm going to go ahead and bring on our guest, Chris Carwacky. That's the right way to say it, isn't it? That's right. Uh, right. I, yep. I like it. Carwacky. But this is Chris, guys. Thanks for coming on, man. We're excited to have you. Oh, man. It's my pleasure. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, we've had some pretty nasty weather here the past couple of days. So I haven't been on the water, but uh, excited to get back out when this first early tropical storm gets out of here i'm not used to these early spring tropical storms yeah any storm with a name is never a good thing no but um we're doing well it didn't really hit us too bad up here but we do have the wind today from it that's for sure yeah but um but other than that we're doing we're doing pretty good you know with the the whole covid pandemic thing we've we've thankfully had some restrictions um eased back recently yeah because I'm fishing both in Maryland and Virginia, so and both states are allowing for charter fishing now, which is a good thing. Cool. Were they shut down for a little bit? I know Virginia was, right? Well, it was complicated. Yeah, Virginia was shut down until May 15th, but Maryland was open with some limitations. So, you know, we could fish Maryland waters, but you know, for me, where I where I fish on Tangier Sound, it really helps to have Virginia open because I'm. Um, I'm a, a very short distance from the boundary line, and I'm gotcha. almost always in Virginia, 80% of the time or more. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's good that it's opened back up. It's it's been a good outlet for a lot of people being able to get out and go fish with all this going on. So many people at home. I know you're probably the same way, but I had a lot of cancellations like right off the bat, and then I had a lot of stir crazy people calling me, and they're like, "I got to get out of the house. Can you take me and my kids? I want to get down to the <laughs> coast and do some fishing." And so. Um, it, it's just, it, it's cool to see that, I mean, it's scary, you know, with the economy hurting like it is, but people want to recreate, people want to get on the water and fish. And so, um, I think we're going to see that kind of play out as soon as people, you know, aren't as quite as scared to travel. We'll, we'll see a lot more. Have, have, what have you kind of noticed and seen with everything going on as far as your, your charter business goes? Well, you know, it, it, to be honest with you, it hasn't really affected me all that much, um, because, um, like I said, thankfully, we, we've had, um, with Virginia opening on May 15th, it, it, it gives me a lot more opportunities. But to, to be honest with you, you know, I'm, I'm a shallow water guide, so my shallow water season really doesn't get going until May anyway. Gotcha. So um, it was just, it was all very timely. I usually start in early to mid-May, and just when I was about to start running trips, they, they lifted the restrictions. So I think I lost only like one trip, to be honest nice, with you. Nice, nice. That's, so um, we're good. <laughs> yeah, that's good to hear. That's really good to hear. And uh, like we were saying, people are coming out like ready to get out and do something. They're they're so stir crazy. Uh, well, cool. Yeah, I, know, I know guys are certainly hurting in other states. That's for sure. You know. So yeah, I've got some buddies down in the Keys that haven't run trips in, in you know two two and a half three months, and this is their tarpon season. This is like you know when they make their money, and it's just sad. It's it's tough. So. Um, I know, it's devastating. Even if you're not going to be able to tarpon fish this year, you guys, you usually go down and fish with your guide in the Keys. Make sure you go down there and do some bone fishing or some permit fishing or, or something to help them out because they haven't been able to work at all, really. So um, just keep that in mind when you're thinking about booking some trips later on this summer or maybe this fall. Um, so, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, like kind of where you grew up, how you got into fishing, and how it's you know really transferred into you know being a, a fishing guide. Sure. Um, well, I'm, I've always been a, a lifelong Maryland resident, um, aside from going away to college in Virginia for a few years. I did go to Virginia Tech back in the late 90s. Um, but, you know, I, my father was a fisherman. His father was a fisherman. So I, I started fishing at a very, very young age. You know, my dad used to take me out on boats and fish from shoreline when I was two years old. Oh, cool. And um, probably could start casting um, reasonably independently, probably around four or five years old, I guess. And it's always been a part of my life. 
So, you know, I grew up doing that and grew up fishing, you know, on the seaside of Maryland and, um, and on the Chesapeake Bay primarily. But then back in the, um, oh, the mid nineties, I'd say 1994, we started fishing on Tangier Sound just to kind of escape the crowded parts of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, like the upper and middle parts of the Chesapeake Bay are very crowded. And my dad just, just wanted to get away from it. So we, we started fishing Tangier Sound in 94 and fell in love with the place instantly. And, you know, from there on out, that that's the only place we've ever fished. So um, over 20 years now, I've been exclusively fishing in the shallow water down there. That's awesome. Pretty cool. So for people that aren't familiar, yeah. kind of explain exactly what the Tangier Sound is and how that works and how it's kind of where it is in, in relation to the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so... Um, as you know, the Chesapeake Bay is, is pretty much the largest estuary on the East Coast. Yeah. And as you head down towards the lower portions of Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay, I guess if you were to line it up with Ocean City, Maryland, if you were to cross the peninsula to the Chesapeake Bay side, um, that's where Tangier Sound would start. Um, and basically, if you were to look at it on a map, Tangier Sound actually looks like the Chesapeake Bay in miniature set within the bay. Oh, wow. It's got, it's got the mainland of the eastern shore um, there, um, but then you have these barrier islands out there in the sound. Um, you, have, you, know, you have like Bloodsworth Islands to the north, and you've got uh, the famous Waterman's um, Islands um, of Smith Island, and then you've got Tangier Island to the south. And then in the way southern reaches, you have Watts Island. So it, it, you know, and then along the mainland, you have all these, um, you have all these tributaries like the, the Monacan River and uh, the the Big Animessex River and, and so forth that feed into it. And then you got Pocomoke Sound to the south with the Pocomoke River. So you have this um, this really unique shallow water estu estuary that has all these barrier islands, and it's all marsh and. Uh, these marshy islands just they they you know they slowly erode away over time and they break up and so you have just all this interesting shallow water structure grass beds um, submerged stump fields um, from when the pine trees used to exist and yeah. um, various flats and creeks and also it looks like you're down on the Gulf Coast to be quite honest that's you. super cool yeah is how's the water clarity um, and some of that shallow water stuff that you've got you know it. it Honestly, I would have to say it's probably the, the cleanest water in the Chesapeake uh, just because the place is just so dang remote and we have a lot of healthy grass flats. So it, it is very clean and it is very clear, but it's not um, clear enough to where I would call it a, a sight fishery. Gotcha. Um, there are some instances where you can see fish swimming, especially if they're on sand, but the bottom is usually too dark to see them. Gotcha, gotcha. But if you were to, I guess, put on a pair of goggles and go snorkeling, you would see just fine. That's awesome. You know? That's really cool. Um, so do you live there close by in the Tangier Sound, or is that somewhere you're kind of traveling to to fish? During the season, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually living in the town of Crisfield, Maryland, which gotcha. is right there on the little Animessex River. Right so it's very convenient for me. I, I can just pretty much walk to the boat ramp and 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 get set in for the day. Yeah, that's so. super cool. So it sounds like, from what you're describing, it's probably some pretty incredible waterfowl hunting there as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. With the shallow um, grass flats, and I see all the waterfowl stuff behind you. I'm like, this guy might duck hunt. I might have to ask a question or two. Just might. You know, I, I used to duck hunt a lot until my daughter was born. Okay. So I have a I have a six year old daughter. So that's um, pretty much leaves me only time to fish these days. Yeah. But Oh yeah, with all those marshes and, and grass beds, and you know, it's a tidal fishery, but we do have some non-tidal um, hunting down there as well. But cool. yeah, oh yeah, it's um, you know, puddle ducks, plenty of widgeons, pintails, gadwalls, um, mallards when they migrate in, um, and then we have a pretty good sea duck hunt hunting as well. Lots of um, redheads and canvasbacks. That's awesome. That's so um, cool. Oh yeah, we could cool. uh, we could dive into that rabbit hole. And but we got to keep ourselves focused on the fishing fishing for this oh, yeah. podcast. Maybe this winter. <laughs> yeah, maybe this winter. Maybe we'll do that this yeah. winter. Well, cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about the fish you target there um, in the, the Tangier Sound, and, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Okay. Well, um, I guess it's safe to say that the, the, the predominant fish that we're catching down there in the shallows is um, school-sized striped bass. Cool. Um, there are just so many of them, um, and sometimes, you know, you can come across them, they can be tiny. You know, um, but on average, they're running about 17 to 20 inches, I guess you could say. Uh -huh. um, um, we, 
I guess a bigger fish for down there to catch in the shallows would be 28 to 35 inches. Cool. Um, we're, we're not often um, targeting the giant migratory stripers that are that are cruising through the main parts of the bay. We do get some in the area, but um, I personally don't target them. But it's nice to have the schoolies around because they're great action and they're they're super aggressive and you can catch lots of them. But um, I guess my um, my bread and butter fish is the speckled trout. We yeah. are um, more or less at the northernmost range of their migration. And um, they start showing up in, in sometimes in late April, but we really start catching them in May. Uh, we, we were just out there for a few days, um, and we were starting to catch our first specks of the season. And they stick around all summer long. They really they peak out in June or July, I guess you could say. Uh-huh. And the fishing lasts until about October. When we start getting that first frost, the, the specks will start migrating out of there. But that that's my, my bread and butter fish, and we get some truly beautiful specks there and we get other fish too you know occasional redfish and bluefish and spanish mackerel nice. stuff like that it's uh a lot of people don't realize how migratory speckled trout really are you know and, and even i mean all the all of our fish our coastal fish really do a pretty impressive migration you think about redfish speckled trout flounder like all these fish are, are moving up and down the coast in and out from the from the, the shore um, and it's really cool but those speckled trout man i had a day uh, here in North Carolina, I think I've shared this on a podcast before, but I was, I went out off the beach. I have a, I think you fish at Jones brothers. I had a, I have a Jones brothers yeah. as well. Um, oh, nice. and a Cape fisherman and was out there, um, trying to find some redfish in the surf. And I was just seeing, I thought they were bluefish at first. So I wasn't casting cause I just had a light tippet on. And, um, uh, I finally casted to him and it was speckled trout, but it was school after school of speckled trout, just swimming South down the beach. Just, I mean, thousands of fish at the end of it but it, it was just pod after pod after pod of fish migrating and i'd never seen it like that like you you know you can go out in the surf and fish for them and target them and catch them that way but i'm like it's really cool to actually see the schools of fish moving down the beach um and people just don't, I, don't realize you know that, that yeah. they're, they're moving so much it, they're a really cool fish and I, you know i don't i don't know what it is about that fish we could be out all day we could be catching some incredible stripers on the fly up to like you know 32 inches and two feet of water and that's awesome but for some reason when we hook like a 23 inch speckled trout they, they certainly don't fight as hard but you feel like you're winning that makes my day yeah. when someone gets the speck i just love that fish yeah they're such cool so, fish and uh, a lot of you know a lot of our specks do come from north carolina do they have you caught some oh, tag yeah, fish uh, up there well, yeah, like, well, well, we used to, you know, there in the, the past, before I started guiding down there, there were some other guides that were participating in a tagging study. And um, some of the, the fish that were tagged in Tangier Sound were later on caught down in North Carolina. Yeah. Now, where in North Carolina, I don't know, but um, a lot of them do migrate up here from Carolina and Virginia. Yeah, it's, so, uh, I, I, I think that, and it's one uh, an avenue that I think needs to be explored. We still struggle so much here with gill netting in North Carolina, uh, commercial commercial gill netting, which just devastates fish populations. And I think if we can show that these fish are migrating and through federal waters and into other fisheries and other states and stuff, like it's just not fair for North Carolina to be able to take out so many fish with a net that that really could bring an income to so many states through or bring money through tackle, through fishing guides, through hotels, you know. Um, and I think that's, that's an avenue that hasn't been explored as much as like, all right, how can we protect these fish if they're, you know, migrating through federal waters as opposed to just, you know, thinking, oh, these, these speckled trout just live in North Carolina all year, which is not true. <laughs> Why the fishing gets so much better in the fall is because we get a ton of fish from up north. It's not because, oh, all these fish just decided to finally open their mouths and start feeding. Yeah, it, it seems like, you know, with a lot of, a lot of the fish that we like to target as anglers, it, it just seems like that. From an economic standpoint, they seem more valuable in the water than they do in, 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 a, in a cooler. Yeah, you know, definitely. It's just, definitely. Whether it's speck trout or striped bass or whatever. So, tell me a little bit about how, or let's really dive into how you're targeting those fish up there. Talk, let's first talk about your boats um, and kind of how that's a good vessel for what you do there, um, and then through that kind of branch into the way. Let's just start with striper. Like, if you're going to go out and target striper, what are you looking for? What are you doing? Well, you know. Um, so you said you wanted me to start talking a little bit about the boat that I run. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah. I like you. I, I run a Jones Brothers Cape Fisherman, um, twenty-three foot, and you know, it's North Carolina built, Moorhead City. 
Um, is that is that correct, Moorhead yeah, City? Yeah, Moorhead City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that boat. I mean, I, I would love to run a bay boat. You know, I'd love to have an excuse to run a bay boat, and I could run a bay boat like a Pathfinder or yeah. something like that. Um, I would love to have an an excuse to buy like a, a, a technical Poland skiff. Right. But it's just the the crossings that I have to make to get to areas. Tangier Sound, it just gets ripping out there, and it's always windy, always windy, and the chop gets huge. And um, that that Jones Brothers, man, that that thing just cuts chop like a hot knife through butter. Yeah. It's safe. It's got enough enough um, depth, you know, up, especially up front in the bow where, you know, if I have an older client who's fishing, which, you know, a lot, a lot of my clients are, they tend to be older guys. Yeah, you know, a lot and of the fly clientele is I don't is put them to little... fall out of the boat. <laughs> right. So um, it just, it's, a, it's a really good boat that takes on a chop, but the thing can get just dang shallow too, Yeah, which is super good to me. So what I'm looking for um, – you know, whether it's stripers or trout, I'm hunting for water clarity. Okay. That, that's a huge deal, um, especially for specs. You know, it, stripers, they're, they're a little more hardy. They can, they'll bite a bit more when the water's kind of dirty. But for us, and, and I know this can be different anywhere else, I, I do not claim to be an expert on specs in uh, any other parts of the country. <coughs> Excuse me. But our, our speckled trout here in the Sound, they bite the best when the water is clean. It's got that nice kind of green color to it. Yeah. So if it is windy, which is like 90% of the time on Tangier Sound, I got to make a crossing to get out of the wind. I got to get behind a, a giant island or I got to get, you know, on a flat that's protected or up in a river to a shoreline that that's buffering the wind, you know? Right. And, um, and so what I'm doing is I'm just going out and I'm first looking for clean water. And, and once I get to that spot where I see good clarity, good clean water, you know, I'm looking at the tide, you know, is the current moving? Um, is there structure around, you know, a lot of people down in Tangier sound when they're new to the area, they go directly to the, the sod banks that we have on the marshes and they start, um, pitching baits right to the bank, which is great. You can catch specks that way, and you're probably going to catch more stripers that way. But um, our specks are oftentimes quite far away from the bank. So, are, you know, i got to determine, are they are they on grass beds? Um, are our bigger trout, are they hanging on um, submerged tree stumps? They, they love structure there, oh, yeah. especially if the current's ripping. Um, you know, our trout, they you know, trout love current, but uh, sometimes I find where we are, if the current starts moving too quickly it can shut the bait, the bite down. So if I go to an area where there's a lot of stuff under the water during a hard, hard current, um, those specks, they'll kind of get down in it, you know, just kind of like a trout hides behind a rock in a stream almost, I yeah. guess you could look at it that way. And we'll fish that area and, and the bite will be really good. And, and oftentimes we find some of our, our bigger trout are hiding in that structure, especially in the summer. Awesome. So, you know, current water clarity and structure, those are the, those are the main things that I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, what do you, all right, let's say striper and trout, are, are you kind of throwing the same stuff? Let's talk about your fly choice and your, and also if you're throwing light tackle, what you're using. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's crazy because our stripers and specs, they are mixed in the same habitat. That's cool. You could, we could be anchored in a spot fishing and we'll be catching tons of stripers and all of a sudden the school of stripers will move out and we'll have a school of trout move in. And we'll catch we'll catch trout for an hour and a half in the same exact spot. That's so, really cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're using a lot of the same flies. You know, I'm not very overly technical about stuff. I right. try to keep things pretty simple out there. Um, so when we're fly fishing, um, basic flies, uh, clouds or minnows. You know, mm -hmm. if we're using some color chartreuse over white. Um, if we're using natural color, um, I like to use like a. Um, an olive and tan pattern that's got some copper and gold in there. Oh, yeah. um, it's like that uh, half and half flies that, you know, where you got the hackle feathers, it gives it a little more movement, a little more profile that can draw bigger fish yeah. a lot of time. Um, so uh, mainly that um, deceivers work really well. I like the fish clousers because the hook point rides up and uh, we're fishing over a lot of tree stumps and rocks. So I like, it kind of helps with the snags, I guess. Yeah. Um, but fishing those mainly, um, I, I did have some clients from Texas who usually fish with me once or twice a year. 
Um, they brought some of these feather game changers up with them. Yeah, those um, things are awesome. <laughs> oh, but you do not want to hang them in a stump. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you you spend like two and a half hours time one of those things, and you get it stuck. But man, they, they were great. I mean, we God, we, I had these guys up last July, and they tied on like this five inch pearl game changer, white game changer, and we were fishing that thing over these stumps and just, we were having just hammer sized trout, just annihilating these things. And so oh, the, awesome. the way these things move in the water, it, it's the greatest fly ever. Yeah, it really um, is, but, man. Thank you, Blaine for designing that. <laughs> oh yeah. Blaine is definitely, uh, the man when it, when it comes to that fly. So, um, they are super effective, but not what I would call a good guide fly for that area. No. <laughs> and so if you have new anglers on the boat, right. that, um, that might get hung up. So, you know, I try to keep things simple that way. Um, we do fish poppers. I like, you know, Bob Banger style poppers yeah. or you know, those double barrel poppers and things like that. Whatever can make a big racket on the surface. Um, when it comes to um, light tackle fishing, you know, we do spin fishing as well. If the conditions dictated or some got, sometimes I get guys who are nothing but spin fishers. Mm -hmm. So um, we're casting like um, like a medium light setup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with like I guess ten pound braid, uh, and again keeping it pretty simple, um, a quarter to three eighths ounce jig head, um, chartreuse jig head. I guess I guess it really doesn't matter. With a four inch um, paddle tail shad, like a like a twister, Mister Twister kind of paddle tail shad. Yeah. Um, or you can use like a you know, like a like a jerk bait. You know, soft. I use a lot of soft plastic. Yeah. And um, it just depends on who's on the boat. If I have people who don't fish a whole lot, um, a paddle tail shad, a client, they can just launch those things down, and it works as a search bait. Yeah, and you can just, just reel it straight it. back in. Oh, yeah. You just tell them, reel it in, just get the tail moving, try not to get hung up on the bottom. And these fish, whether it's stripers or trout, when they're here, they're so freaking aggressive that they just they hook themselves. But, but then again, I do have some really, really um, competent – um, light tackle anglers on the boat now and then. I've had a couple of guides actually from down your area come up, and man, they so these guys can they can twitch baits like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Like you know, like that pop pop pop. You know, they can just do that three quick twitch and let the bait fall. And if if you can do that, that is deadly, as I'm sure you know, especially with specs. And it, I've seen these guys when they come out on the boat with me. It doesn't matter what the tide is doing if it's running. Or if it's slack, these guys can work that bait, and they, when it falls Draw like those that, bites. They, oh man, they can feel every little tap, and they've caught some huge fish doing that. That's awesome. Um, that's super cool. Do you see kind of color play into you know water clarity? Are you throwing different colors based upon your water clarity, or uh, uh, doesn't seem to matter too much? I don't. I don't. I don't. I hope I don't sound disappointing when I say this, but no, it doesn't really matter a whole. <laughs> no, <lot>. that's fine. <laughs> That's fine. That's good um, to know. So explain to me so I can wrap my head around it. Like what is an average day fishing the Tangier Sound? You go out, like what does one expect? What do you, how do you sell your, sell to your clients? Like what a, what a day is it during prime season up there? Well, it depends on what time of year it is. Um, fortunately, you know, we have a pretty long season. We can start in April and we can fish through November, sometimes even later if it's a mild winter. Um, but let's just say, um, let, let's pick, um, let's, let's pick a, a hot month. Let's pick July. Okay. okay let's, let's look at, let, let's say late July. All right. It's stinking hot. It's going to be 98 degrees that day. And let's say we're going to start the morning off with an outgoing tide. All right. The winds are laid down. It's calm because summer it can be calm in the morning before the storm's rolling in. Right, the afternoon. Right. So what we'll do is oftentimes if the client wants to, we'll go out there to the main part of the sound in the deeper water and we'll go out to around some lighthouses and some buoys out there. And we might start off looking for birds, you know, we'll have bluefish in the area. And that's a good way for them to work the bugs out with their casting and stuff like that. And we'll get on a school bluefish and, and we'll start on them. Or if it's, you know, late July, uh, Spanish mackerel are in the area. We had yeah. a really good season on Spanish max last summer. Oh, man, they're so and fun we'll to start... catch on fly, too. Such oh, yeah. an underestimated them... creature on the fly rod. Oh, heck yeah. And we got them in the shallows there, too. It's crazy. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we could start off like that. And once, let's say that bite dies down or they get tired of it and that tide starts going slack and it's about to come in in a bit, I say, well, you guys want to go hit the shallows now? And 
And the, of course, that's what we're here to do. So what we'll do is we'll make a run down south and we'll catch the early parts of that incoming tide. And and um, during the summer, at least where we are, this speckled trout, they love an incoming tide. Yeah. It just it, it it can bring a little bit cooler water off the main sound and just a, a two degree different it can, a degree difference. It can brush across that flat and trigger a bite. And so we'll fish specks on the incoming. Um, even in the hottest parts of the summer, we'll, we'll catch stripers. Wow. Um, if it's early and they want to start fishing poppers for stripers, um, we'll go out to some shallow water structure and we'll start fishing for big stripers on poppers. That's awesome. Um, and then we'll go looking for specks, you know, and, and you can fish through the day. And that's, that's the crazy thing. A lot of people think, oh, the striped bass, they're like a, a low light fish. And, and, and you're, that's true. You know, the bigger fish do bite in overcast conditions. We had a, a guy, um, just a couple days ago, we were fishing. It was, it was really windy out, and we were behind some islands, and it was overcast, and we were fishing super shallow grass bed, and this guy caught a 30-inch striper, mm. which is really, which is a lot of fun in the shallows. So, you know, that's the case. But during the summer, that's how we roll. You know, we'll, we'll catch, as long as that water's right, and we got salty water there, so the, there's a lot of oxygen in it, so that we don't have problems with fish being caught then dying when you release them right, in the water, as right. long as they're and and we'll catch them and and specks all through the day. God, that's um, awesome. Spanish mac. We caught we caught Spanish mackerel under popping corks in the shallows there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You. That's, it's, it's that's crazy. incredible. <laughs> I've uh, I caught a span. I haven't caught many Spanish mackerel in awkward places, but I was way up in the Cape Fear River one time, which is a coastal river we've got down here near Wilmington, and uh, fishing a little. It's called a 3ds minnow. It's like a hard bait. It's a Yozuri hard bait and hooked a fish. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is a big, this is a big, uh, trout. I was trout fishing. We were catching them pretty good. And then all of a sudden it skied back behind the boat and I kind of caught it out of the corner of my eye. Like the fish kind of jumped a little bit after I hooked it. And I was like, what the heck? And I thought it was a trout jumping and, uh, he ended up getting to the boat and it was like a four and a half, five pound Spanish mackerel, like in a little Creek. I was, I was pretty blown away that he was there, but other areas like Louisiana, which I would kind of consider to fish similarly to the Chesapeake Bay, it's a very large, shallow, you know, estuary. I've seen Spanish mackerel there, really shallow, but that's the only other place I've heard of or seen Spanish mackerel shallow. I know they get actually in Florida, the Sierra mackerel and Spanish mackerel get shallow. I mean, I can imagine when those fish are in shallow water, they're a blast. They're a blast to catch. Oh my, oh my lord, it's crazy, and um, and and they can get quite big too. And it, it's just, it's just. They they just run. They're they're like a bluefish almost, like on steroids. They yeah. just they just charge hard. It's really cool. I love that fish. Numbers wise, on a good day of trout fishing, there. What do you what are you seeing on the fly rod? How many how many trout can you end up with? Man, um, it depends on the year. Um, so just bear with me. You know, some years. Um, I know several years ago down south there were some fish kills with the hard freeze. Right. Um, down the Carolinas and stuff, and that and oftentimes that can translate into a a slow trout fishery for us um especially in the spring they, they usually show up pretty good in the, in the late summer but uh last year uh last season my god we just we had epic speckled trout fishing some of the best speckled trout fishing i had ever seen um and and like i said um usually in the summer uh a, a good day for trout on a normal year would be to maybe catch like a dozen trout or so, yeah. maybe more, um, and mostly stripers. But um, last year, especially in late June through the third week of July or so, I guess was the peak of it, we were catching more specks than we were stripers, which, wow. which kind of blew my mind. And there was a couple trips where we went out, and I had a, a couple good anglers on the boat. I remember one day we caught 70 specks. Golly, in a six that's hour. awesome. Oh, I'm not kidding. Yeah, and they were, every last one of them was no smaller than 18 inches. Yeah, that's fun. So um, it just, I, I hope we get that again this year. It's already looking like a good year. It's, here it is. It's, it's mid-May. Um, I just, we were out the other day. It was blowing. We found some clean water, and we caught um about half dozen really nice speckled trout so it's shaping up so i'm I'm pretty pumped about it this year i think it should be a good year man no big freeze really anywhere on the coast and uh, oh yeah it kind of hurt the duck hunting but the fishing i think we should see see a good year our near shore fishing here in wilmington so far this spring has been awesome like everything that we've had the opportunity at so far bonita albacore in the spring which we don't usually see for that long we had them for like a month and a half 
Um, the king mackerel fishing, as far as the smaller kings are already, it's really good. And so hopefully we'll, we'll see that up and down the coast. And it's cool to talk to someone, you know, that's fishing the same population of fish in a different area. So like you're targeting those speckled trout up where you are and to hear that it was so good up there those fish moved down you know their guys are catching them all the way down we still caught them good here in north carolina it just shows how you know how hardy those fish are if we don't if we don't jack with them too much they can really you know really do a lot down here this year people were saying you know even old timers were like this is the best speckled trout fishing we've seen in you know 30 40 years we don't and a lot of guys are like we've never seen it this good before it's it's silly, and it, it draws a lot of people to the water. You know, there's a lot of money made for the state just from gas, hotels, tackle. You know, it's 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 nuts. Yeah, I, I you know I um, you know a couple guys down there on the the Carolina seaside. And they were talking about how good the spec fishing was last year, and and then I, of course I got clients who own homes down in the Outer Banks, and they were talking about how they were catching specs last year. It just sounds like it was a really good season for a lot of people, for which sure. is really cool. So the striper that y'all see there, are they there year round, or is it mostly filling in more in the in the warmer months where you see them? You know, I think I, we do have a resident population of fish that do hang out there year round. Um, like when it's freezing out, I'm by no means out there targeting them because I just want to want to be at home. Yeah. Uh, usually these days, by the end of November, I'm I'm done with it. Um, I need a break. But but yeah, there have been um, seasons in the past where. Um, our resident schoolie fish, which is like, you know, your smaller striper up to in the thirties or so they hang out. And, you know, we were, we were, there was one year a while back where we had a mild winter. We were catching them in the February back yeah. in the marsh creeks. So they, they hang out in the, you know, the deeper channels in the winter or in the parts of the creeks and stuff. So yeah, we'll be out duck hunting sometimes and uh, we'll see stripers busting bait back there in the creeks. I'm like, damn, wish I had a fishing rod with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. A little cast and blast trip, if you will. Okay. Um, so, but besides the trout and and uh, and flounder, you, so you said you mostly do the shallow water stuff. So you're you're mostly focused on trout, striper. Um, and we were talking, I think, pre-show that that the cobia do show up a little bit outside of where you are in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, yeah, there there is a cobia fishery in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I I do not do that just because yeah. um, it's it's not my focus. It's not it's not what I like to do. But there are guides who definitely make their their um, their living targeting these fish, and the the cobia fishery, from what I hear, is very 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 good. Um, from the you know the Baybridge Tunnel up to um, even adjacent to Tangier Sound, these guys are out there in, in their tower boats. I know uh, Tyler Non, who yeah. um, he he runs a, a a Jones Brothers that's a tower boat. That guy's just dialed into the cobia, so he's definitely a really good guy to you know, to talk to about that, but they are certainly out there and we even get, um, large schools of, of red drum that come into the bay, the main parts of the bay during the summer, huge, huge schools of them. But like I said, that's, that's not what I do. I know guys like Tyler, Tyler and those guys, they're targeting those fish as well. Um, so they're definitely, uh, good people to talk to about that, yeah. but, but they're out there and they, and they do now and then work their way into the sound, you know, like there are some large red drum, in the sound right now it's it's mainly a bait fishery you know every time i'm out there fishing i see guys just sitting in the same spot all day long with peeler crabs out there fighting cow nose rays all day long and <laughs> and then they'll then they'll get into that school of reds and they'll catch them but um that's not that's kind of not not again not my thing we're not sight casting to them if we see them we're gonna cast right. them, and it has happened um my first encounter with a big school of reds was quite a few years ago my dad and i are out running our boat in april and we hear something hitting the bottom of the boat we thought we were hitting some crab traps or something under the water we were kind of freaking out and, and the second time we heard that sound i looked down i see just cop, giant copper fish swimming in the the side of the boat i was like all right dad we got to cut the engine here and we made some casts and we only had medium light tackle on the boat with us but <laughs> a bunch of heads. so they're out there and if you see them of course they're going to get something thrown at them yeah, yeah definitely yeah. They're not picky when you find those big schools of redfish like that. Um, yeah. Speaking of fish hitting the boat, I'd heard about it. I fish Weldon, North Carolina, which is on the Roanoke River. There's a big striper uh, spawning push that comes up the, the Roanoke River there. And I'd heard yeah. people say that those fish will bump into your trolling motor sometimes when, when they're real fired up spawning. Um, yeah. I was sitting there with this trolling motor on spot lock and some really slow current. I, I heard like, 
And I was like, oh crap, we're hitting something. And I looked, there's no stick or anything. And then, yeah. like, and, and then I looked and I stood there for a second and these striper were coming up and just slamming into the trolling motor while it was spinning. You know, because oh, it's this yeah. commotion on the surface and I think it's the fish coming up to spawn on the surface. And it was crazy. I felt bad for him. I, I killed it and kind of drifted away from that area and, and kept fishing. And we were having so much trouble hooking fish. We were marking them like crazy on our on our screen, throwing the fly to them, and just throwing little clouser minnows. And uh, they were... Uh, we'd, we'd get like a fish every 30 minutes, but we're marking thousands of fish. And so when they get that real hot spawning going on, they're, they're so hard to get them to eat. But I had a guy up there tell me, he's like, imagine, you know, you're in high school, you're making out with your girlfriend on the couch and somebody <laughs> comes and sets a, a cheeseburger on the, on the coffee table. He's like, you're going to, you're not going to just go right to the cheeseburger. You're going to finish what you're doing and then, then eat the cheeseburger later. So I was like, ah, oh, that makes more sense. Understand now. the mindset of a spawning shark. <laughs> right, exactly. I was like, thank you for breaking it down for me. <laughs> yeah. They go bananas. Um, um, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, we used to do a lot of shad fishing on the Susquehanna river, which is in the upper bay. And we'd be out there, wade fishing for shad with ultralight tackle and yeah the stripers are up there a lot of times spawning in the river too so you feel them bumping into your legs and going between your feet and stuff and and every now and then when you hook a shad you'll have a big striper swallow the shad but oh, you know gosh. you're not you have no chance because you're using like six pound tests right, you know, right. but yeah they get they do go nuts so explain to me real quick we're, we'll wind this up here in a little bit but um mm -hmm. The, these striper that you're targeting, what is their kind of migration pattern? The fish that you're actually seeing there in the Tanger Sound. You know, that's that, that's kind of a mystery to me. You know, I like I said, I'm not sure. Like these scolies that are there, I'm not quite sure how what their range is as far as migration goes because yeah. a lot of these are local fish. Um, you know, I think a lot of them are spawn and the tributaries that feed into the sound. Like to the north, you got rivers like the Nanticoke River and the Monocan River. Okay. And I think a lot of our fish come from those areas. But when it comes to them holding over, I think they're just moving to deeper parts of the bay, out to the channels or um, out to the deeper parts of the sound. Or they, a lot of them spend their winters back in the marshes in these deep tidal creeks feeding on marsh minnows and crabs and things like that. Gotcha. Uh, but then when they reach um, maturity, I don't know, I can't remember what the exact size is where a striper decides, hmm, I'm going to join the pack and migrate out of here. I'm, you know, I know there are some guys that are biologists that specialize in that stuff, but, you know, the, but they will leave at some point in many cases. But and in most cases, um, the fish that we are catching as far as stripers go in the sound are your resident school size gotcha. striped bass that are trying to reach maturity. Awesome. Yeah, it's uh, the striper migrations are, are crazy to me. I mean, they're just you know they're in all these areas and they all you know group up. And even how we had they used to have those big fish off the coast of, of North Carolina that that people caught for so long the big you know massive cow stripers that we don't see anymore. It's uh, oh man, that's a that's a shame, man. That fishery went out like my back in the the late nineties, early two thousands, every winter, my dad and I used to trailer the boat down there. We'd go down to Nags Head and put the boat in there at Oregon Inlet and if we had a nice day, we'd go out there and fish out in the ocean. We just slam giant stripers out there and That's we had awesome. this hasn't really happened as far as I know and we haven't done it in many years. Yeah, is it is it have to do with you know the overfishing of the bait? Is that what I've heard, or have we just killed a lot of the the strand of those fish? Because I've seen pictures, of, you know, back in the day of truck beds full of dead, you know, sixty pound stripers. I think there's a number of factors to it. You know, it's definitely a, a, a political thing here, but I think just too many big stripers are being killed. Whether it's by recreational anglers. You know, the commercial guys, a lot of people are quick to judge those guys, but, you know, commercial guys, they're the most regulated people out there. Yeah. they got to follow quotas and they got to report. So I just think, you know, too many too many big breeding-sized fish being killed. And then, of course, you had all the issues with the Menhaden fisheries being decimated. Um, but like I said, there are people who are who are better than I am at explaining that, that problem. But I, I think what it boils down to is, is that, these breeding size stripers, they, they got to be left alone. Yeah. You know, they're, they're too precious to be killed. Yeah. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but I think if we were to, you know, the moratorium back in that, you know, the eighties and stuff, when that moratorium was lifted, I mean, there are, there are giant stripers everywhere. You could walk across their backs on certain days on the Susquehanna flats when that moratorium was lifted. And I think it just goes to show if you leave those big cows alone, they, they will repopulate. You know, but, yeah. but 
got to stop killing them. Yeah, for sure. Again, that's that's a political thing. That's just my opinion. No, I'm with you. I, I'm with you on any big fish like that. I mean, they're the, they're the ones that are creating the future of the fishery for us. And if we take them out of the water, and it's like, right? what big fish? At, you know, when a fish reaches its largest size, they're they're the worst to eat. You know, the little 17 to 20 inch fish, trout, redfish, flounder, uh, Worms, striper. Oh yeah. yeah. There are people that will steal them up and say they're the greatest thing in the world. I mean, that's great and all, but nah, yeah. I, I'm not, I don't want to eat a giant striper. No, I don't let that I'm thing you. make a bunch of babies. I'm with you. Yeah, I'd rather eat or I'd rather catch fish than eat them. So I'd rather catch more fish and eat less fish. But that's yeah, just well, me. Business if we if we kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We can't uh, we can't kill our business, but. Well, cool. Well, is there anything else you want to leave people with? You let them know about your fisher. I definitely want to get into after this, you know, how people can reach you and book a trip and get on the water with you. But anything yeah, sure. is about your fisher you want to you want to leave people with? Oh no, I mean it's it's you know like I said it's a great fishery and um, like I said we have a long season. We usually start in May and we fish through November. But I think the cool thing about Tangier Sound is that it's a bona fide summer fishery and a lot those hot months for a lot of people in the chesapeake bay are like all oh, the fish the fishing's off we're catching nothing but white perch and catfish now in the bay that's not the case in tangier sound it could be 100 degrees in mid to late july and the fishing is rocking down there that's so awesome. um that's a misconception but yeah it's it's a great fishery it's shallow water it's awesome for the fly angler because it is shallow um and the fish are, we don't have to like cast sinking lines and count to 20 before stripping the fly back in. Right. Uh, so we are sight casting along shoreline. We are drifting banks and we're casting the structure. And if you're a caster and you like to cast streamers, um, this is a great opportunity for you to do that in a saltwater environment. But yeah, I mean, if, if, if you're interested, you can certainly find me. And my website is chesapeakeonthefly.com. And, or you can give me a call at 443-722-1333 and, and then I have, you know, a Facebook page and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. You can just look up my name and find me on there. And I try to post pics, you know, on a regular basis just to show what we're doing. So, yeah, I'd be happy to take people out. Right on. Yeah, I might have to uh, eventually slide up there and do some fishing with you. I love the Chesapeake. And uh, the only real fishing I've done up there is cobia fishing and, and stumbling into some of those groups of big bull redfish down near the tunnel. But um, I'd love to explore some of the estuaries. It, it's really uh, I'd cool. be happy to take you out, especially cool. since you run a Jones Brothers. You, uh, <laughs> you got the best boat there on the water. It's a it's a good boat. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Well, uh, well, cool. Well, guys, for y'all that were listening and not viewing this, if you do look him up on Instagram or Facebook, it's it's Chris Carwacky. That's K A R W A C K I Carwacky, which is an awesome last name. I would. I think you'd have to change it to Carwacky Guide Service. <laughs> it's just such a strong you know, the, last name the best guys just use their name right <laughs> <laughs> i guess so i guess so i hear you uh, but um well cool well man thank you so much for coming on and uh we'll definitely have to have to stay in touch and and do some fishing together but guys check him out go check him out on his social platforms and then book a trip with him go up there and catch some striper and speckled trout in the chesapeake bay just such a cool historic uh, area to to be on the water and to fish and to hunt it's there's a lot of a lot of history there but thanks again man Oh, thank you. I appreciate you contacting me. It was a lot of fun. Definitely, definitely. Well, guys, thanks again for checking out another Eastern Current episode. Uh, we are hopefully going to start doing some more live episodes here in the future with the coronavirus and everything going on. Internet has been pretty crappy in the evenings, and so the, the times I've tried to live stream um, these recordings, I've, I've they've been dropped, and it's made it real tough to, to finish out the recording. But but stay tuned, and, uh, and we will see some more live recordings popping up in the near future. Uh, and until then, hope you all catch some fish, and we'll see you in the next episode. Later.